Okay, so uh, my name is uh, Yoav Luft. I'm a, full, I'm a full stack developer. I'm working as freelance now. I'm also uh, a game developer since like we started like three months ago, so it's pretty new. Uh, I've been working with Python. It's actually the second programming language I ever learned. The first one was C. Uh, so I've been working with Python from uh, 2008. And I've worked with it professionally in like full capacity for the last three years. Uh, and I'm also uh, one of the people, uh, one of the three of uh, Cafe Bots, which is uh, a podcast in Hebrew about uh, programming and so on. Uh, the one also Noam is part of, uh, of the podcast. Okay, so what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about today uh, about uh, text parsing in Python using two libraries that I'll introduce. We're going to talk about combinators, which is a uh, a fun little uh, design pattern. And we're going to talk a little bit about monads, which is also a kind of a design pattern. Uh, so let's start. So we, we're starting from text parsing and why text parsing is, is even interesting. And the fact is that we need to do text parsing in all kinds of occasions. We have to, talk, to parse user inputs, such as uh, strings and dates and so on. And we have to parse uh, structured data files, uh, JSON files, XML, uh, proprietary formats. Uh, we have to parse uh, programming languages, and we have to parse natural language. But natural language is a bit uh, out of scope for this talk, so we're not going to talk about it. Uh, have anyone here ever tried writing a parser? Okay, so I see a few brave souls. Uh, you probably know that's not very fun, but we're going to see like uh, some better ways to do that. Uh, so text parsing is not a new kind of problem. Uh, and there's some well-known approaches for trying and solve this problem. Uh, one of them, the most familiar one, is regular expressions, or regex for short. But, well, regular expressions have uh, two major drawbacks. Uh, the first one is that Regular expressions have computational limits on what you can actually parse when you use regular uh, expressions. Uh, the second is the one that anyone who ever used regular expressions know that, is that they're difficult to read. They get ugly really, really fast. If you ever got to see this one. <laughs> so, Another approach, uh, a very well-known approach, is called uh, YAC. YAC stands for Yet Another Compiler Compiler. And that's a compiler for compiling compilers. Uh, you can see an example for YAC's grammar file uh, in this example. Um, we're not going to go over the grammar file. We're just going to be like, OK, yeah. So. One problem with YAC is that it has very hard to understand grammar files. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, it had some C code inside the grammar file. And it's kind of hard to know when uh, the C code starts and the grammar and the uh, YAC grammar ends. Uh, but the really major problem is that when you use YAC, you have to embed this grammar file in one programming language and then compile it into another programming language and bind that into the first or sometimes a third programming language. And that's really, that's like no way to, to create software. So what we want to do, I uh, want an expressive representation of grammar. Uh, that's what Yak does, but in a very unfriendly way. But we want to do that in our native programming language, uh, in this case is Python. Today we're going to talk about two uh, software libraries that, uh, that do exactly that. The first one is called PyParsing. Uh, PyParsing started in 2001. It's a mature library. It has lots of documentation and examples for like a not very large library, at least. The second library we're going to talk about it is uh, called Parsec. Parsec is actually uh, originally a Haskell library, a bit older than PyParsing. But that's not a uh, Haskell con, so we're going to talk about a Python implementation of this library, which is a great implementation. But first we need to understand what is a grammar. Uh, 
So a grammar is, ben is basically a bunch of rules that we use to define a language. It says like, this language is defined from this rule, which means this rule, and rec recursively. We'll take CSV as an example. Uh, our first CSV rule says that CSV is a header and then zero more rows. Uh, and then we have another rule that says a header is just the same as a row, and we have a rule that says a row is a field and then zero more uh, comma-separated fields uh, with some terminator. Uh, a field is either a string or a quoted string, and we have our regex-like rules for string and quoted string. Uh, that kind of gra grammar is called context-free gra grammar, and that's the kind of grammars we're going to limit our discussion on. Uh, so how we parse this kind of grammar uh, using PyParsing? Uh, that's actually very simple. We start by constructing uh, a cell parser using our regex parser and the OR operator. Uh, the OR operator is a special parser that it's going to take uh, the left operand, try to parse using that one, and then it will, in, in, if this parser failed, it will try the right operand, which should also be a parser, and it returns a parser. We then use the delimited list helper, and we combine it using the plus operator, uh, and we use a method called uh, suppress, that means that tells PyParsing, I'm not interested in the output of this parser, only makes sure that it actually matches anything. Uh, header is not interesting, it's just an alias. And finally, uh, PyParsing requires us to use group that tells PyParsing how to uh, organize the output. And what we get is uh, this kind of thing. We get this very small program and we use uh, CSV, that's the last uh, variable we define. We use its method, parse string, and we get some result object. And inside the result object, we have whatever being parsed, organized the way we wanted. Uh, let's see what parsecpy does. Uh, in parsecpy, it looks pretty much the same. You might notice why there's more lines of code, but that's only because I want to separate the quoted string case into another line, and because parsecpy doesn't have a built-in and offline parser. So I, I had to write one uh, myself. Parsecpy uses some other operators. It uses the current operator. It's called try choice. It's exactly the same as all and it uses the shift left operator that says uh, parse using both, li both left and right operands, but ignore the output of the right operand. The same thing that, parsec pi, uh, that pi parsing does with suppress. Uh, then we just gather everything with a plus operator, and we need to trim spaces ourselves because uh, parsec pi doesn't do that for us. But we end up with uh, pretty much the same thing. We have a CSV object that we're going to use uh, its parse method. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we're going to get a resort object. Uh, it's a bit simpler than the one PyParsing gives us. And well. It's pretty much the same. I think, I, I hope you can agree in this point that they do pretty much the same thing. But you might notice like the way we used operators and functions to get like other things in order to combine them. This technique is called combinators. Uh, combinators in this context, it has some other meanings in computer science. Uh, combinators are functions or function-like objects that accept other functions in order to create a new function that has some new functionality. Or, yeah. So how, so we're going to see how, uh, we're going to see a small example for a combinator function. Uh, this is a very simple example. We're going to take the do function and we have our on fail function, that's do kind of function, I'm going to return a new function. This function is going to, to call uh, the do function, and if do throw raises any exception, we're going to call the on fail uh, function. Uh, and it looks pretty much like that. I mean, you see we use like uh, and the integer uh, type, which is also a function that would convert, we try to convert to an integer, and if it fails, we're going to return uh, the we're going to return my minus one. Uh, let's see how pi parsing 
build its combinators. We're going to look at the add parser. Um, and first, we can notice that the, it's a class. Uh, it's a class that inherits, uh, yeah, it was simplified. Uh, it's a class that inherits from a uh, parse expression. Parse expression is a complicated class, so uh, I'm, we're not going to talk about it. Just We're going to just talk about the, the, the core things. And this is the parse impl function. Uh, the parse impl function is the one that actually does the parsing and starts by calling the first expression and it's going to save the location, the result, and then it's going to call all the other expressions and it's going to append the results of the other expressions and it's going to update the location and we're going to gather everything into a list and return that. That's basically what it does. Uh, in ParsecPy, we have a similar combinator. It's called the joint. And in ParsecPy, we can see first uh, that joint is a function. It's not a, it's not a class. And we can see it's a, a function that is, it's a function that returns a function, what we would accept from uh, combinators. But it does pretty much the same thing. It's going to iterate all parsers, and it's going to gather the result and it's going to update the index uh, from each iteration, and it's going to put all the results into a list. And then finally it's going to do something that new and that's putting all those results in a value uh, kind of wrapper, which is something that, Pars that ParsecPy uses for combining results. That's, again, it's pretty much the same. They're both very similar in the way they solve problems. But things get interesting when we start diving into ParsecPy and we start looking at this parser decorator and what is this decorator and what's its, uh, what its function around here. So let's have a look at this one. Uh, it's a decorator class. Uh, I guess you know decorator classes. Uh, it's going to wrap a function um, and, return and create a function um, this function is going to be a function from text and index into some value object. And not only it's going to give us a function, it's going to give us a function with some added power. This added power is all the method we see below and all the other methods that I couldn't list because it wouldn't fit uh, the screen. But in other, way, in other terms, we can say that it's going to take some function, uh, a function from text to index, uh, from text index to value, and it's going to lift it into the parser monad. Okay, I think we're going to talk about monads because lifting and monads and all this are kind of, I know, strange terms that people probably don't hear uh, of uh, very often. So the first we thing we need to remember for understanding monads, uh, we need to first remember what are the basic elements of our program. And when we talk about monads, we're talking about types, which could be anything, and we're talking about functions. And we're going to look at it a bit. So types are all the types we know in our uh, language. Uh, it could be integer, a string, uh, a tuple, uh, custom classes, and so on. And functions are in the context of monads are just mappings that go from one type to some other type, or even back to the same type. Uh, we can create our own functions that go from one type to another type, like the, like the one we used uh, for creating the parcel. But we can do even more interesting stuff. One of the interesting thing we can do, we can create special box types. Now, these box, box types, they, have, they come along with some functions, uh, usually constructors, and these functions are going to take some other type, and they're going to put this type inside a box. And we can use some other function. This function is going to take a function, and it's going to transform it into a function that works on box types. That's clear? Oh, okay. We tried it again. When we talk about monads, uh, we talk about special types, context-aware types, that wrap other types. And we talk about functions that map values from some type. 
and some other functions that can take, can take those functions that value values from one type to another and turn them into functions that work pretty much the same way, only they're now aware to the special context box we use. Uh, and we can see an example of how, of how it's being used. We're going to look at the failable monad. Uh, the failable monad has some other names. Uh, one of them is either, that's, it's a bit cryptic, and it's a bit similar to some other well-known monad called option or maybe. Uh, but it's a very simple monad. So we start from the failable class. And we say that this class uh, has some value. And it has uh, some context. This context is called uh, success. And it has, some, uh, it has uh, two uh, inherited classes. That's our constructors that we use to construct different values of this class. And everything else happens inside this bind method. What this bind method does, it's going to accept any other function. This function is going to accept the value of our uh, failable instance, the value contained inside. It's going to call uh, the bindy function and return its result. But it's going to do it in only in one single condition. If the context says this failable has been a success, because if it's not been a success, we don't know what it's going to contain. So we're just going to propagate whatever value we put in, in it last by returning the same uh, object. We can see how it's being used. Uh, in this example, we define a function and we start by, by constructing a success value from whatever this function gets. And then we bind three other uh, lambda expressions. The first one is going to multiply the, the value by three. Uh, the second is going to check if the value is an integer, and if not, it's going to replace it with a failure. And the third one is going to raise the value uh, up to the power of two. So we can see that uh, when we call it with an integer, everything works okay, because uh, we multiply the integer uh, by, by three, and then we check if it's an integer. It's an integer, no problem here. And then we raise it to the power of two, and no problem, we can do that with integers. But what happens when we give it a string? When we give it a string, well, you all know that in Python, when you multi multiply a string by three, you're just going to get the same string repeated uh, three times. So no problem with this one. Uh, the second expression is going to replace uh, our value with a failable, a failable object. This means that when we get to the third bound function, it's not going to be called because now we have a failure object. This failure is not a success, so we can call this lambda expression. So in this way, we avoid an error. I think we're almost ready to look at the parser monad. We just need to remember one more, uh, two more things. The first thing is that uh, functions are just types. Uh, we, can, uh, we can give functions as arguments to other functions and we can return functions from other functions. We've seen it in the example so far. And we should remember that our parser is simply something that wraps a function, which we just said, it's a kind of a type. It wraps a specific function. It goes from a text and index tuple into value. So, to understand how the parser monad works, we just need to look at the bind method. And we can look at this bind method and we can notice some important features of it. First of it, it's going to return a new parser. That's exactly what we want from a combinator library. We want to keep combining stuff. And that's what we want from when we uh, implement uh, monads. Uh, the second thing we have to notice is this uh, this new parser is going to use the current parser, the current parser's result, and it's going to give the bind D function the result of the current uh, function. But we should also notice that the bind D function should return a new parser, because we're going to use this parser to keep on parsing. The final thing that, this, uh, that we need to notice is that if the, last, if the current parser had failed, uh, we're not going to uh, call the bind function because we said we don't want to call functions on failed, uh, on failed results because we don't know what it's, what it's going to do. Uh, we can see an example of how it's being used. 
So in this example, we're trying to create a parser by count. We start by a function. This function is going to accept some count. We're going to hope this is an integer, but we're going to handle the case where it's not an integer. And we're going to return a, a new parser using the separated parser. And, using, and this parser is going to pass the, just this count of, uh, of separated values. In the case that, it's, uh, that we actually haven't got any integer not, or something we can convert into an integer, we're going to return a special parser that's just going to fail because we don't want to keep on parsing. And we use this function by using bind, the bind function we just seen, on some other, uh, on some other parser. And we're going to get a new parser called counting parser. Now, this counting parser, uh, we're going to call it like the last examples we've seen. And it's going to uh, pass this string. It's going to see that the first, uh, the first value is an, is an integer. It's, going, it's two. So it's going to return uh, a new, it's going to call our parser by count function. And it's going to return a new parser. Um, this parser is going to expect only two values. So we can see that the result is only two values and not the whole string. This is exactly what we wanted. And it seems, uh, I think this kind of stuff is pretty cool. But can we do better than that? Well, it turns out that PulsecPy, yeah, uh, they actually do better than that. Uh, they created a cool little generator function, a decorator function called generate. This decorator function is going to take any generator any, gen any generator that yields uh, uh, parsers, and it's going to turn it into a parser. So in the context of this generate, uh, fun of this, uh, generate uh, decorator, each time we yield a parser, it's going to use this parser to parse the text. Uh, when we yield with uh, an assignment, uh, something very cool I didn't knew before, and I've met this library, uh, that you can assign the result of a yield and when we're going to do that, uh, we can bind the result of the parser, like the inner value, the same thing that bind did, we can bind it into uh, the context of our generator and use it later. So in this example, we start from a simple cell parser. Uh, it's going to uh, parse uh, digits, uh, combine it uh, into a string, and then going to uh, convert it into an integer. And we're going to yield the first parser. It's a cell parser. It's going to try and parse uh, any integer. And we're going to save the result as, as height. We're going to yield another parser. And we're going to ignore its result. We only want it to keep on parsing. And we're going to yield a third time in order to get uh, the width that we want. And now we're ready con to construct the, the rest of our parser. And we're going to do that by using width and height that we already got from the first uh, two parsers. And we're going to do use that to define two other parsers. And we're going to return this parser. Now, the decorator function, uh, it knows that when we return a function, uh, when we return a parser, uh, that's the parser it's going to use for the rest of the parsing. So I don't have an example of this, uh, of this code, but trust me, it's going to parse uh, 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 metrics. And we're almost ready to wrap. So what we had today, uh, we've seen two parsing libraries in Python, uh, PyParsing and ParsecPy. And we've seen water combinators, and we've seen, we had a glimpse of water monads and mostly how, how they can be used to create uh, new libraries. But just one more thing, like a last thing of monads. Uh, monad, monads is a kind of term that people uh, say it a lot in the last years, and a lot of, th of people think it's like something very new and shiny, and it's very related to functional programming, and it's probably some fashion that is going to pass. But Parsec, the, the library on which Parsec Pi is based, is 19 years old. I mean, that's pretty impressive. It's uh, almost as old as, old as Python, which is uh, 25 years old, I think. Uh, and the inspiration for this talk came from a post from 2008. So people actually used monads in Python. Uh, nine years ago. 
And yeah, one of the places that people use monads in Python is in Tornado. Uh, it's a web server written in Python, and they use a, a syntax very similar to the generate function, to the generate decorator. Uh, we use, and they use that in order to handle uh, coroutines and async, uh, or the async uh, action and stuff. If you use the JavaScript, uh, you've probably seen promises. Promises are monads, are basically like the simplest kind of monads. And if you used uh, some reactive programming uh, frameworks, such as RxJS or uh, Guava or uh, Link from C Sharp, so you, you had used monads. They just they don't tell you those are monads. So that's, that's what I had uh, to tell you today. Um, we're going to wrap it up with that. Oh, oh, no, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm freelance. We're not hiring. Uh, I hope you had fun, and I think we have uh, like three minutes for questions, yeah? Ah, okay, okay. So no questions. Have fun. <laughs>